This uh, shear this morning is uh, going to be recorded. I'm also putting in, um, I'm asking, uh, so there's someone else on the call. I just made a co-host uh, because there's supposed to be a waiting room. The waiting room didn't work this morning, so for whatever, whatever reason. But uh, here we go. Let's, uh, let's learn a little bit, and particularly this, uh, this year. Uh, I want to share with you some thoughts today. Shabbos Haggadah Drush. It's really the second Shabbos Haggadah Drush up that I'm giving uh, in as many days. On Thursday, I gave one about Urchatz and Rachza. It was about Halacha and Hashkafa. It was more of the classical sense of the notions of uh, Shabbos Haggadah Drush. This may be a little bit out of the box, but my goal this morning is hopefully to give tools to each of us as we're going into our Seder. All of us, I think without exception, all of us will be at a Seder this year where it will feel different, uh, more threatened, more uncertain. Some of us will, all of us will be sitting uh, in a different way than previous years. Some of us will be going to our Seder alone. Alone can be defined as just two people. Alone can be defined as literally one person sitting with their matzahs and their, uh, their wine, their grape juice, and their maror. Uh, lots of helpings of maror for many people this year. And I thought to present something that, frankly, I've been thinking about for the better part of two years. Hashgacha uh, me'it Hashem, that I didn't speak about it last year, Shabbos Agadol. But uh, this year it seems rather apropos, so I'm, uh, I'm rolling it out. And these thoughts have been germinating for me for over uh, two years. A uh, year and a half ago, I sat down, actually, the pen and paper started writing it out. Uh, and it's still uh, percolating in my mind. So here's what I'm up to now. I'll share some thoughts. I hope it could be helpful for people. If I'm successful with this drasha, Kodesh Baruch should give me uh, help to do this. Hopefully, people will gain chizuk from it. Strength, divrei chizuk, to be able to go to the Seder, and also, I think, to take strength from the Seder itself. Let me explain. First of all, you know that uh, we say that uh, the uh, arrival, the advent of Medinat Yisrael is no small thing for Klal Yisrael. Whatever your walk of life within the Jewish people, there's no gain saying that Eretz Yisrael having now and Medinat Yisrael within it is a great boon for the Jewish people. Talmud Torah, a great boon for Klal Yisrael to have a home, refuge. And of course, we see at this time uh, that uh, Klal Yisrael, even in Eretz Yisrael, unfortunately suffering mightily uh, and trying to do whatever they can to protect themselves from this terrible virus, uh, as we all are around the world. But what's interesting is that from their place of uh, uh, bididut of people sitting in quarantine and isolation, we also find that people's creative juices are going. And um, there are a couple of songs out there already. I'll reference uh, one of them uh, uh, now and one of them a little bit later that really uh, speak to me. They're, they're, they sound on the face of it uh, not all that happy uh, in their tone. But I think they're, they're instructed. They just came out within the last few weeks. But it shows the creative impulse of Avira di Saul Machim that the heir of Eretz Yisrael itself brings wisdom, as the Gemara teaches us. So there's a songwriter named Hanan Ben-Ari who wrote a song. It just was released. You can find it on YouTube called Gaguim Livne Adam, Longings for People. He wrote this in isolation. And one of the things that he mentions in the song, which is a song really, in my view, about Cheshbon HaNefesh. Cheshbon HaNefesh, so each of us should think a little bit, what am I up to my relationships with other people? He talks about how people are always flying around. No one has time for other people. There's a particular stanza right at the beginning where he says, Kvar Cheshav Nutzach Nuakol. We thought we had conquered everything. Ben Adam, Mitzarich Ben Adam, who even needs people? Migdalim Bashamayim Baninu, I read it out of order, excuse me. Migdalim Bashamayim Baninu, we built towers in the sky. Ben Adam, Mitzarich Ben Adam, who needs people? Lo yavo od mabul biyameinu. There will not be another flood, another great uh, uh, flood in our time. So I want to just open with the sense that uh, we should have, as we're learning today, and as we're going to our Leil HaSeder, of a universal dimension to everything that's happening. It's happening to us as human beings, and also as communities, and also as families, and also as individuals. There's no gainsaying that we've passed through a door. The world has passed through a door. A great moment, a moment filled with awe, and fear, trepidation, and uncertainty. Me, I go back always to the Gemara Masachet, Bava Batra, and Daf Ayin Gimel Amidbet, the Gemara that teaches among the stories of Rabba Bar Bar Khana, who was a great traveler, a world traveler. He went all around. Rabba Bar Bar Khana, Zim Nachada. One time he says, Kazlina Besfinta, we were going in a ship. And as they were going in the ship, he says, we found a little island. 
We got up onto the island out, out of the ship. We started baking. We started cooking. But then we realized something wasn't right. It turned out that this island the Gemara describes was not an island. It was a sea creature. And as its back was heated up by the fires of the cooking, it flipped all the people into the water. If we weren't near the ship, we would have drowned then and there. This Gemara I spoke about years ago on the Yamim Noraim, but how so many of us feel that we found places of stability in our lives, and then something happens, and we are overturned. Our dry land, our Yabeshta, turned out to have been a kavra, a particular type of a sea creature, a fish. It had sand on the back of it, maybe a little grass. We thought this is the oasis in a world filled with tumult. But then suddenly, suddenly we were thrown into the tempest, thrown back into the ocean of uncertainty, into a chaotic existence. And we're asking, what's going to be with me now? I want to help us to make sure that we have a ship, a boat, through which we can weather this storm. Perhaps you could call it even a bit of a teva. Now, one of the things that influenced my thinking, and I'm going to get to the Seder in a moment, one of the things that influenced my thinking about this was uh, a book that I uh, highly recommend. It's uh, not a Jewish book. It has a lot of imagery from other, another religion, which is not our religion. A person has to be careful reading books generally, but uh, that's not to say a person shouldn't read. Uh, the book is called 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos by a Canadian thinker and a college professor uh, and also a, a, a psychologist, clinical psychologist, private practice for many years. His name is Jordan Peterson. And in this book, among other things that he talks about, I'll summarize in a couple of lines, is that so much of the world can be defined as the gap between chaos versus order. Chaos, uncertainty on one side, and order, a way of looking at the world that there is certain structure. And he notes that there's corruption at the extremes of chaos and at the extremes of order. Now, let me give you an example of where this comes up. The Western, Western civilization, that is to say, Aristotelian philosophers and the like, they think erroneously that when it says that God created the world, it means that there was already something, it was chaotic, and then Hashem brought order by creating the world. Therefore, you have the order of the creation and the Briata Olam, and everything's organized as against an existing chaos that existed. Tovavo was before. But of course, as Rav Soloveitchik points out in several places, this is not our way. When we say every day, Yotzer Or Vore Choshech, it means Hashem, you make the light and you also created the darkness, meaning Hashem, you created all of it, including the chaos, out of nothing. And when you think about this a little bit, you could think that every single day we have a mitzvah to remember that we left Egypt. If you look in the sitter, any sitter that you have in your house, if you open up, you'll notice that we do not spend too much time talking about all of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. I'm using my art scroll sitter that I have in my home. If you have one, you can open up there. It's in Shachris any day of the year. We have the Shema. In the Shema, we mention about coming out of Egypt. Shotzeit Yitchem Eretz Mitzrayim. But then we get to, in my sitter, it's page 96 in the art school, whatever sitter you're using, Koran, whatever, Sidur, we have the section of Zrat Avotenu. We do mention, as a one-liner, that we were taken out of Egypt. We mentioned that there was, in fact, a point in which we were saved from the house of bondage. We mentioned the death of the firstborn. We mentioned how our firstborn were redeemed, and in fact, that the Jewish people, B'ni B'chor Yisrael, is redeemed. But then listen to the detail that suddenly we get into. And the scene that we're meant to remind ourselves of every single day. We're meant to imagine ourselves standing at a particular moment of the process of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. And it is, of course, standing al Sfatayam, standing at the edge between land, terra firma, that which is ordered, and that which, since the time of Briat HaOlam, that which has never been ordered the Yam, the ocean. And we stand al sfat hayam at the edge between order and chaos every single day. Therefore, in longhand, we start describing. Longhand. V'yam suf bakata, 
Vizadim Tibata, Vididim Hevarta, Vichasman Tsaren, Khadman Lotar. So we describe in detail. You split the sea, you cause the wicked ones to drown, your beloved ones you cause to pass through. The enemies were covered with water, none of them survived. Alzot, upon this, Shibhu Ahuvim Verum Mu'el. Upon this, did the beloved ones give praise and sing, uh, exalt the uh, exalt the, uh, the Almighty. But not the the beloved ones gave shirot, zimirot, shirot the tishpachot, music, song, and words of praise, brachot vehodaot, and blessings and uh, thanksgivings to the king, the melech el chavik hayam, etc., etc. What do we describe? Moshe uvnei Israel lecha anu shira b'simcha raba ve'amruchulam. We're standing al Sfat Hayam. Shira Chadasha Shibhu Gilma Shimcha al Sfat Hayam. There, at the edge between order and chaos, the world as we expect it, and the world that is always and forever a tumult. Veruach Elokim Merachefet al Pnei Hamayim. The spirit of Hashem, as it were, hovers over the waters. That's at the beginning of the Bri. After Hashem created the world, that's what Hashem did. He then had the spirit of Hashem so to speak, upon the primordial waters. It's the first thing in the Bria. In the beginning, Hashem made something out of nothing. Order was going to come there from the chaos, but even the chaos, even the Tov Avo, created by Hashem. In one's mind's eye, before we stand to daven every day, we don't go back to describe that we sat at the Seder and we ate the food or the ten plagues, or the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu took us out of Mitzrayim, how we marched as 600,000 men between the ages of 20 and, and up, who were at the, the, and that's without the women, the children, etc. Two to three million people are marching out triumphantly. No, none of that, none of that. But we go back to one thing every day. I'm back at the edge between order and chaos. And I want to share this with you and remind you of this just to think about it. Because at the moment of the Sfat Hayam, we are meant to stand here and think on a daily basis about the point, not of Kriyat Yamsuf, but right after Kriyat Yamsuf. Let's talk about the Seder a few minutes. I'm going to come back to this, but I just wanted to sort of set it up. Now let's talk about the Seder. Why is it called the Leil HaSeder? The night of a Seder, the night of order. So very practically, whether you have, your family is constituted of uh, 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 a, uh, many people, many, whether your family is now, it's going to be a solo Seder. Maybe it's going to be you're having the Seder alone and it's just two people. Maybe. The Shulchan Aruch tells us, Aruch mi yom. Set your table up before the holiday starts. You think, I'm by myself. Who, who, who cares? Set the table before. Make order in your home. What are we doing now in the cleaning? Everybody's running around cleaning and koshering. We're making a seder in our home. Order to confront chaos. The chaos might be out there, but in our own homes, we need to do what we can to set our tables. Seif Bet, I'm reading from Shulchan Arach, Simon Tuf Ayin Bet, Seif Bet. Yes, listen to the words. Yisader Shulchano Yafe Bekelim Naim Kefi Kocho. A person should order Seder, their table, with the nicest possible dishes that according to what they have, they should put on the table. They should uh, arrange their place where they're going to sit, to sit in a way that exudes freedom. Set your table. Make a Seder at, of the table, of the home, of the table, but also here an aesthetic component. I want to suggest that the way that we take care of ourselves, aesthetically speaking, to the extent that we can, whether our table or whether our own selves matters. Try to look your best. There's no one at your Seder, you're by yourself. You're not alone at your Seder. I would submit that Judaism maintains that Hashem is at your Seder. That might be small balm for, balm for the wound for a person who's sitting with just a little bit of wine and some matzah and lots of maror but realize the following. We're engaged in a religious activity here. And that religious activity calls on us to see that beauty does matter. A sign of freedom is beauty. I would urge those who have an opportunity to try to look in the mirror before Yontif, and in general, by the way, not just Yontif, all the time, even throughout all of this, to dress their best. 
a lot of jokes going around the internet about how uh, people have tumult in their home, but on Zoom, they wanted to show everybody like everything's fine. Everything's not fine. But a person should try to make themselves up to look nice. If nothing else, for themselves and for Leil HaSeder, because we're in the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in more, more of a way than we normally are. This may seem like a small point, but I've talked many times from the pulpit in our shul, if we're not going to go to Eretz Yisrael, Meshach Tzidkenu's arrival now, who knows, maybe we are. If not, at least it will go back to congregation or Torah. I've spoken many times about how clothing matters. Clothing matters now. And a person should realize that it's hard, it is challenging to get up every day when you think, well, no one's going to see me. And to brush your hair, take a shower, and the people who put on makeup to put on makeup and to look nice. Why? Seder. Seder. This is hard. But particularly the night of the Seder, to set one's table in that way. These are halachas I'm describing here, by the way, about the Leil HaSeder. I'm reading it from the Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch, Taf Ayin Bet, Se'if Chet. Tzarech Lishtot Dalit Kosut, you have to drink the four cups, Al HaSeder. Vimshtan Zach Hazesh, Lok HaSeder, Lo You have to drink the four cups in order. Not just in order, one, two, three, four, but in the context of the Seder. If you didn't do that, then you cannot fulfill the mitzvah halayla. I'm skipping all the heavy machinery today, you understand. This was Shir and Shul, so I explained to you the Ran uh, and uh, the way the Taz describes it, based on the Ran, the Prima Gadim, there's a lot back and forth. I'm, I'm cutting to the quick over here for want of time. You need to drink the four cups with a certain orderliness. There was a man who was confronted by terrible destruction. And somehow Hashem saved him, saved his immediate family, and saved all of the animals in the world. But when he came out, he had so little left. He saw such things before him, and he realized, I have to build again. I had a whole world. The whole world was destroyed before my eyes. And, and now I have to leave? So how does the Torah describe it? Chazal say that Hashem was telling Noah HaTzadik, go, go out, go out, go out. And what did he do? Nabuch, he planted a vineyard. The first thing he did was he got drunk. I hope when this is over, not one person in the world will ever look at Noah HaTzadik again with the same eyes. Will ever think that a person cooped up inside something for 12 months of confinement with all these responsibilities and no sleep, taking care of the animals. The madras says he slept two hours a night and occasionally an animal would bite him. He didn't feed them on time. No one will ever look at Noah HaTzadik again. I believe, as anything other than the greatest world tzaddik. Sadly, when he came out, all he could do was figure out, let me just lose myself and escape. But Chazal teaches us that the Leil HaSeder is not about escape. It's about taking the wine and about lifting the goblet and saying, I remember. I recite Kiddush. I have a, three other kosot. Each of those is part of the Seder Halayla. It has its place, not for excess, but for orderliness. I'll confront the chaos with my goblet of wine, my goblet in my hand, which I'll raise up and say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you are the Melech HaOlam. You created this. I know it's part of the world, but I'm not going to let it rule me. I will rule it. So patience and, re and recognition and acceptance of Noah HaTzadik for his greatness, but at the same time, at the same time, realizing where unfortunately he fell. And we shall not fall in this way. And when it's a three-day yontif, people, I was thinking, it's challenging three days yontif. Is anyone ever going to complain again about three-day yontif? How long it is? Look how long we're already. A few weeks, and we have no idea when it will end. They were all in our homes. Tzarech lishto dalet kosot al ha seder In a certain orderliness. And by doing so, we are makadesh, even this fruit of the vine. Or Makadesh wine itself. Rav Moshe Lichtenstein, the Shivat Haratzion, the Rosh Hashivi Shivat Haratzion, noted that the Rambam has a parallel between the Seder Avoda of Yom Kippurim and the Seder Avoda of Leil HaSeder. Listen to the words of the Rambam and the, uh, the Rambam, how he writes uh, at the beginning of Hilchot Avodat Kochavim in the fourth chapter. Seder Kol HaMaasim Shebiyom Ze Kach Hu. 
Here is the order, the Seder of all the actions that are going to happen on this day. Here's what they are, colon, and then he starts telling you what to do. We open up the Rambam, Hilchot Chamit Sumatza, Perichet, Halacha Aleph, Sidur, Asiat, Mitzvot, Elu, Belel, Chamisha, Asar, Kach, U. The order of the doing of the mitzvot on this 15th, uh, uh, the night of the 15th, here's what it is, colon. And then he tells you the order of how to run a Seder. If you look through the rest of the Rambam, the Yad HaZak, and you can search for it very quickly online, there is no other syntax that matches between two different things. And I would submit to you, and I mentioned this when we did the session about how to run a Seder. Uh, yes, you can run a, your own Seder if you need to. I pointed out that there's only two nights of the year where people, uh, men, Jewish men, wear a kittel. One of those, of course, is Leil Yom HaKippurim. The other one is the Leil HaSeder. The Nitziv of Elijah at the beginning of his Haggadah says, the kittel that we wear on the night of the Seder, in our case the Siddharim, reminds us that we are engaged in a grand avodat Hashem, a service of God. And we're dressing in white and purity as the Kohanim themselves did dress and will dress in their kutonot, in their white tunics, in order to perform avodat Hashem. Yes, we are lacking now the Korban Pesach, but still, but still we are sitting at our Leil Ha Seder, the Seder of Sidur Asiat Mitzvot Elu, B'chamisha Asar, and we declare Kahu, so it will be. So I want to share with you a piece that if I share with you one Torah tonight, today, this morning, it should be the only piece, hopefully, that you'll take home as a piece of Torah. I'm going to try to, in fact, if I can, I'm going to try to put it up on the screen because I want people to be able to, uh, to look at it and to read along with me and hopefully to take it with them. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll just listen. I'm going to read it word by word, but I just want people to, uh, to try to be able to uh, experience it and to be able to take it uh, with them as well. This is the words of the Sfat Emet. The Sfat Emet wrote this for Shabbat HaGadol, the year Tov Reish Nun Dalet. The Sfat Emet writes about the Seder. I heard from my grandfather, he writes, Al Shekorin Lel Pesach Seder. Why do we call the night of Pesach? We call it the Lel HaSeder. Bechain Omrim at the end, we say of the end of the Haggadah, Chasal Sidur Pesach. We have completed the order of Pesach. Lirmoz to remind us of what the Maharal taught us. Seder Leteva. The Maharal of Prague teaches that as there is an order to nature, there is a specific and unique order to the miracles and the wonders of the world. But says this, Father Met, I want to add something else. Pay close attention to this, and hopefully for those of us who are feeling like we're going to be alone, we can take this with us, at least at our Seder. Writes this, Father Met, Venerally od perush, Seder, Lirmoz, Shegam, Kol, Taluchot, Galut, Hayaha, Kol, Seder, Miyuchad. Every part of the process of exile is also part of the Seder. It's also part of an order, and we should feel it that way. Shelo, Nomar, Kikara, Siba, Shishalat, Paro, Al Bnei Israel. We should not say that it was just happenstance. We should not say it was just some kind of causal chain of events of geopolitics and the way of the world that Paro had ruled over the Jewish people. Rock, rather, everything was part of the plan. Hashem told Avram, he told him already what's going to be. To remember this idea, to consider that in fact, as the Sfatimet goes on to say, every part of the Seder, Every part, including the suffering, including the challenges, everything was part of that Seder. Read your Haggadah. The stories of the Haggadah about the processes, processes of their suffering and of their screaming and crying out to God. This is all part of the Sipur Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Everything was under the direction of Hashem, may he be blessed, for the benefit of the Jewish people. Can I see it now? Can you see it now? It's challenging at the moment. 210 years of Klal Yisrael asking themselves, no, 
this is this is this is why we came to Mitzrayim. That there's some promise that we're thinking maybe there's going to be a promise that someday somehow we're getting out of this from Egypt where no one ever escaped from Egypt. The Gemara says no slave, no prisoner ever got out. We're leaving. Hashem's going to take us out of here. Yeah, where, where are the great Nevi'im now? Where are the great miracles now? For 209 years, this was a resounding question. Says this Fatimet, this is part of the story of the Seder. To remind ourselves that everything is part of it. Lachain, therefore, ha-mitzvah, the mitzvah of eating the Korban Pesach is davka al-matzot u-merorim. Both the matzah, symbolizing the redemption, and the bitterness. Shiyesh to shabayach al hagalut kemo al hagiula to praise Hashem, to thank Hashem also for the exile as much as for the redemption. Ah, goes the Svatimet goes on to say, Yesh Dorot. Indeed, however, there are generations. Sheseder Hanachon Lahem Hu Hagalut. The order of those generations is exile. Vyesh Miuchadin El Achayrud Vagiula. And some generations are designated as the generations of freedom and of redemption. According to the one who knows all secrets, only Hashem knows. And that's why Chazal teaches in the beginning of the ninth parak of Masachat Brachot in the Mishnah, whatever God meets out to you as a portion, thank Him. Thank Him a lot. That's in the Shema. Hashem knows how to organize every generation according to its order. Everything ultimately is chesed. As it says, through his kindness, does he direct every generation. Then once again, he quotes the Chidushi Harim, the great Zayda, and the one who raised the Sfas Emes, when his father died, when the Sfas Emes was a little boy, his Zayda raised him, and he became the next Geru Rebbe after his Zayda. So said the little boy who became the Sfas Emes that he heard from his Zayda. When it says in the Haggadah that you and I are going to read this coming week, they made it very bad for us. As it says, Vanitzak, and we cried out, as it says, Lomar to teach us, Shenase Mikolze Parsha Betorah, to teach us that even from these parts of the Haggadah, even the parts about how bad it was, even the parts of crying out to Hashem, all of these became Parshas, sections of the Torah. Everything that happened, even the suffering, even the screaming, Everything was somehow in the manner of the Torah itself. And the words of a wise one are filled with grace. And he writes, and this is what I wrote. This is basically what I just wrote. That everything is part of the Seder, a unique Seder. Everything is part of the order and needs to be ordered in a way of relating to and praising Hashem. This will be challenging for many of us this year. But to recognize that our Seder, our Haggadah, is not just the story of deliverance. First, it's the story of great challenge and of great loneliness from Hashem. Let's talk for a couple of minutes now about the Seder plate. I mean, physically, the Seder plate. I actually had a question this week, someone, last week rather, someone uh, sent me an email. What's the order on the Seder plate? Does it matter? Like, does it matter how you put things down in the Seder plate? So what I want to show you is that actually it does matter. Many people in the inside flap of their Haggadah have little pictures about how to put the foods out on the table, how to actually organize it. You have your Haggadah in front of you. You can open it up. It'll show you the pictures. Like I'm holding a Haggadah here in the front. It'll give you the, the pictures of how you, uh, how you lay it out. Not this Haggadah, this one. It'll tell you how to lay out the pictures of how, the, how it's supposed to look on the table. Different people have different Haggadahs, and therefore they're going to have a different picture about how to lay it out. So I'll show you. These are two of them. I'm going to show it to you now in a much larger format. If you're on Facebook Live, you'll have to look it up after, so to speak, in the notes over here, what I have scanned in. I'm going back to it. I want to show you what it is. 
This is the order of the Seder plate according to the Ramah. The Ramah believes that the operative principle at the Leil HaSeder is to organize your Seder plate in a particular configuration on the table. If you don't own a Seder plate, you don't have to go buy a Seder plate. You could, very nice, beautiful. Go get a nice Seder, you're living in Chicago. Why not support uh, Rosenblums? Go get a Seder plate from the order. They'll dri drive it, put it in your trunk. It's very nice. But let's say you can't get one for some reason. You don't have, you can't afford, can't get, there's nothing in your price, or whatever. Take a plate, a plate, an actual plate, and organize the following things. The Ramah says the organization should be in the order in which your hand will reach those mitzvot halayla. It's a principle in Allah called Ema virin ala mitzvot. You have a mitzvah in front of your face, you cannot skip it to do something else. There are many implications again, I'm skipping the heavy machinery for this morning to cut to the quick. So the Ramah writes, Karpas and the salt water is going to come first. Then you're going to eat matzah. Then you're going to dip the mar in the haroset, etc. And that's therefore the order. That's the Ramah. A mavir and ala mitzvot. What many people do, however, which is actually, frankly, this is what I do in my Seder, my Pesach uh, a plate, is I do it according to another organization, which I got. Again, I learned it from my Zeda, Zichon Alivracha, um, Yaakov ben Shmuel, uh, Zichon Alivracha. And the um, Shem Shedav and Aliyah, just the mention of his name, central figure in my life, and particularly for the Leil HaSeder. This is how I saw my father, Lahavda ben Achan ben Achan, my father's home. You should live and be well. And you see, this is the Arizal's organization. The Arizal's organization seems to defy the order that it's supposed to be. The order is supposed to be, Ein Mavir Nala Mitzvot. No, says the Arizal, the order is something really, really different. And on the face of it, strange. The order needs to be, the order of the Zroa and the Beitza on the top, the Mora just down below a configuration like a triangle. You see how it's ordered here? Then below it, the Charoset and the Karpas and then the Chazeret. That's really the correct order, says the, the Arizal. And that's actually, I do this, what I do at my Seder. Many people do this as well. I'm zooming in a little bit. You can see it more in depth. Why is this the order? I want you to look at the words that are on top of each of the elements of the Seder. Some of you will recognize what this is, others you will be baffled. So let me say it in layperson's terms. I'm going to tell you what they are. It's the order of what's called the Seder Hasfirot. I cannot explain this to you now any more than in a 101 class, the pro professor can come in and say, let me tell you what's in the 401 class and you're going to know what I'm talking about. This is like astrophysics. Like, like astrophysics is to uh, physics. Uh, this is uh, what I'm telling you now to uh, the baseline of uh, understanding things at the Seder. We have an understanding, a certain understanding, of how HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. A lot of that understanding we are confounded by and we, are, we don't have understanding. But what we do understand has to do with, among other things, a long-standing tradition whose roots are in the time period of Har Sinai. And they go through each of the generations. You want to see where these words appear actually in Tanakh? They actually appear at the last speech that David HaMelech ever gives Klai. So it's in your Siddur. By Yivarech, David, Et Hashem, Leinei Kol HaKahal. We take out a Sefer Torah, say, Lecha Hashem HaGedula Ve'Hagura Ve'Hatiferet. What we are saying there is what's called the Seder of the Sfirot, of the ways in which, the attributes through which God runs the world. The Zroah is Chaser. The Beitza represents Kivura. Tiferet, Maror. Netzach, Charoset. Hod, Karpas. Yesod, Chazeret. You'll say to your Rabbi, I am not a mystic. I don't know what you're doing over here. But I'm not, I'm not into this. I don't, know, I don't even know what these words mean or why each of the elements are related to the words. We don't have time to do all that now. But suffice it to say, the point of the Arizal is, do you know how you have to organize your Seder table? You have to organize your Seder table so that in a very subtle way, you're reminding everyone at the table, now you'll know, even if it's just you, that this is the way Hashem orders the world. And I will order the foods of the night of the Seder in the way that Hashem, so to speak, orders the world. It's actually like this pattern actually matters. I'll give you one, I'll give you like uh, 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 three examples right now, just from the top, since you asked, or I'm sure you're thinking, what? Zroah, God took us out with an outstretched arm. Says the, the various commentators on the Arizal, who is the one who came up with this sort of structure to do it this way graphically, Chesed, by Hashem reaching out to scoop us up and save us, that's the Zroa, that's his outstretched arm, reached up and cradled us and brought us out. The Beitza is an egg. Gvura means mightiness, not just strength, but especially potential strength, and sometimes withdrawn strength, 
Gvura Ezu Gibor Kovechi Yitzro means that it's God has, so to speak, held back his power, not because he doesn't have it, because he's holding it back and not expressing it. The baits of the egg represents potential life. It's going to be, but it's not yet. It's living in the not yet. It has tremendous potential for the future, but it has not yet come into the world. That's Gvura. What is Maror? So the Gemara says Maror is called uh, uh, Tamcha. You're supposed to use something called Tamcha, which the Gemara says, how do you translate that into Aramaic? It's not going to help us, except if you speak Hebrew. Chasa. Chet, Samach, Aleph. Chasa means, we call it in modern Hebrew, lettuce. I think it's spelled with a hey in modern Hebrew. Chasa, lettuce. Chasa, say some of the commentators, when you eat the romaine lettuce on Pesach, it starts off the way it grows, very soft. The Gemara actually says this. The Gemara, excuse me, the Gemara on Pesachim. Starts off soft, and then as you leave it in the ground, it gets harder and harder. It starts soft, gets bitter. Starts nothing, becomes something. So what do we do? We temper the maror's taste, which is an amalgam of the zeroa, the softness, and the hardness. The softness of chesed, the hardness of gvura, sometimes also called din. And what do we have in the middle? Rachamin. Okay, so you may say, well, that's, whoa, that's crazy mystical. But say it like this. My Seder table shall have a microcosmic representation of the world. The Sidur HaKe'ara Alpia Arizal. The organization of my table and the elements of my Seder to remind myself there is a God who is running this world. And I'm trying to emulate him, so I make my, my Seder plate this way. Many of you have seen the Hasid, many Hasid, maybe you have this at home as well. I don't have it this way. Many have. It looks like a fancy Seder plate. It's the plate. And there's like these two little, just raised up, there's two little pla- little doors. And when you open them, inside there are three little shelves. What's on the three shelves? Three matzahs. The matzahs of Kohen, Levi, and Yisrael, they go underneath. Um, by me and my Seder table, I have the, the Seder plate and a little closer to me, just next to it, according to some of the contents, it could be next to it. If you don't put it under, it be next to the three matzahs. What are those, the three matzahs? So I gave you it right here. Kohen, Levi, Yisrael is another three. I told you there are seven attributes. On the plate here, you have six. Add three more. Kohen, Levi, Yisrael is against the three elements that are beyond the attributes of Hashem runs the world. They are how he runs the world, but they're not even, they're not expressed in this world directly. I know this might sound terribly mystical. Chachma, Bina, Dat. If you, you ever heard of Chabad, the organization, you know what they call themselves that? Because the, what's called the Gimel Mochin, the three aspects of mind, quote unquote, about Hashem, are Chachma, Bina, and Dat, an acronym. Chet, Bet, Dalet, Chabad. That's how they get there. Yeah? So what are these Hasidim doing with the organizing? What am I doing? I'm trying to do also. I didn't even realize it until I started studying the issue more in depth. I'm saying there's a Seder, not just a Seder of my Pesach Seder. There's a Seder to the world that we're in right now. Whatever's going on out there, in here, I remember that even out there, there's a Seder. The Seder is run ultimately by a Kodesh Baruch Hu. I'm doing my little Seder in my little house over here. Kodesh Baruch Hu is running the Seder of the world. Here's the Seder. Now, what's the plate itself? The plate itself represents Malchut. Malchut means kingdom. Remember the seven things. L'chashem ha which means chesed, according to the tradition. V'agivura, v'atifad, v'anetzach, v'ahod, etc. And they say, L'chashem ha-mamlacha. God, to you belongs kingship. Kingship is, according to the Chachamim, who know the, about this world, Malchut means, we're, we're, that's us. That's the part where we say, God, you are the king. That's where we declare there is one king in the world and it is really Hashem. Hashem, Iloch, Leolam, Va'ed. The first time we ever recited those words, we said together as a nation, not one Jew was missing, Hashem, you will reign, you will be the king forever and ever. That's the Midah of Malchut. You know what we're doing at our Seder the whole night? We're saying, Hashem, you're the king. You're running things. Every brach I say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu, Melech Ha'ulam. We're crowning a Kodesh Baruch Hu as the king of the world. You may think it's a little cute story, and he was known for cute stories, but they say about Rabbi Naftali of Rapshitz that he would say at his Seder that when you lean to the side and you put your head on the pillow, when you're drinking the wine, if you listen carefully to your ear up against the pillow, you can hear the sound of the shofar already in the pillow. But what did he mean by that? Because the night of the Seder can be the night of crowning a Kaddish Baruch as the Melech, not in the Mikdash Me'at, in the Beit Knesset, in the Shul, but now in my house wearing my kittel, like the night of Yom HaKippurim, and saying, Kodesh Baruch Hu, you're running it. You're in charge over here. And you're the one 
that we are related to, come what may. When we understand all of this, we can understand that in the Seder Habria, the Seder Habria, the organization of creation, was from the beginning an admixture of balancing and rebalancing chaos and order. Now, the chaos isn't all bad. Chaos isn't evil. Sometimes chaos, a little bit of chaos, is actually good. We need the ocean. But if you notice, there is a borderline between the ocean and the, and the, the shore, the Svatayam, that borderline. And what happens there? The waves of chaos are always lapping against the place of order, in and out, coming out, in, and then receding. High tide and low tide. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less. If the world of the Yabasha, of the Svatayam, the edge of the sea, is ordered and understood, then the world of the ocean is actually one that is unknown. It's beyond. It's a representation of that which is not fixed in the world. I want to share with you the following idea. It comes to me based on the words of Rabbi Tzadik Cohen of Lublin, the Ma'or Vashemesh, and the Bnei Yisachar. So there's an amalgam, basically, of all three. And this idea may sound mystical to you, but I'm going to share it with you against the backdrop of that Jordan B. Peterson fellow I mentioned to you earlier. Peterson says that chaos in the extreme or order in the extreme are both corrupted realities. So you want a good example of chaos in the extreme? It was the generation of the moral depravity that preceded the time of the flood. One person stole from another. Notions of sexual morality were completely upended and upside down on all levels, including much depravity, bestiality, uh, abuse, rape, etc., other things. All of this brought about the moment when the ocean, the chaos of the ocean, overtook the chaos of the land, the moral chaos. From that chaos, only one righteous man and his family were saved. But you can have too much order as well. When there's too much order in the world, that's called tyranny. That's a tyrannical regime. What was the first tyrannical regime? It was 10 generations, basically, after the flood. It was the generation of the building of the Tower of Babel. At Migdal Bavel, there was one language and one idea. Necham Leibowitz writes about it this way. Rav Soloveitchik writes about it this way. This is how they describe the Soviet empire. Came along Jordan B. Peterson from the secular world, and he wrote this about the Soviet Union and about the Nazi regime. He wrote that that's like the Tower of Babel. Jordan B. Peterson, you're an amazing scholar. By hundreds and thousands of years, the coin from Lublin writes that Avram Avinu and the Gemara Masechet Megillah Daf Lamed Aleph describes that Hashem is involved, Avram Avinu is involved in conversation with, uh, with a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And Avram Avinu is being shown by Hashem prospectively that there will be a Beit HaMikdash. And in the Beit HaMikdash there will be Korbanot. And because of the Korbanot, the world will continue to exist. But Avram Avinu gets very scared. He says, Hashem Baruch Hu. This is good while there's still a world. What if, what if there's no Beit HaMikdash? So, says Avram Avinu, Amar Avram Livnei HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Rabbanu Sha'olam, Shema Chas Visham Yisrael Chotim Lefanecha Vata Oser Lehem, Kedor HaMabul, Uchador HaPalaga, maybe you're going to make them like the generation of the flood and the generation of the, of the HaPalaga, the dispersion, where there was too much order. And what was the corrective? Scatter them, spread them apart, mix up the languages, a differentiation of Languages means a differentiation of ideas about how to think about the world. Okay, we need that for the world to continue. There does need to be chaos, not in the negative sense, but chaos in the sense of novelty. Chaos in the sense of chidush, of novel ideas and thinking about things from different perspectives. If everything is fixed and set, then there's no room for that. Says Reb Tzadik Cohen of Lublin. Says the Ma'or Vashemesh in his own way. Says the Bnei Yisachar in his own way, based in the Torah of the Arizal, of the Ariyah Kadosh, in the work that creates Chaim. The people who are the generation of Jewish people 
who were in Mitzrayim 210 years, were the spiritual descendants. They use the term Gilgul. You want to say it mystically, it's literally the souls? I don't know. You want to say it's in the manner of? They are the descendants of the exact people of the generation of the flood, who were in turn then descended into the people of the generation of the Tower of Babel. You see, if the people of the generation of the flood had too much chaos, then their corrective was going to be 10 generations later, where those same souls in the world are gathering around one tower and they say, okay, enough with the chaos. Let's have order. Let's do it in a very orderly way. But that was also corrupted. What happens to the Jewish people? Klal Yisrael spends all that time in Mitzrayim living out the world of a tyranny, a tyrannical regime where that tyranny is unfortunately crushing so many of them in its bricks and it's throwing its children into the water. They lived through that tyranny. Came the makot, came the plagues, and messed up that order and showed that the one who really controls the order of the Bria is only a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And then the Jewish people start walking and they leave Mitzrayim. They have, to borrow the terminology, they vanquished the dragon. They're finished with their enemies. He got out. God's running the world. All will be right. Nothing bad can happen now. But what is that sound? What is that dust cloud behind us? The sound of hoofbeats, of chariot wheels squealing, of people sounding trumpets and heralds and soldiers chasing us? Let's get away. Let's get... Where are we? But we have nowhere to go. But facing us on the other side is only one thing the churning waves of chaos, of uncertainty, of the unknown. We're going to get through this? We're going to survive this? No, we're not. It's over. Because now an army that has been trained for two centuries, we watch them lead us and subjugate us. And we have these little weapons, whatever we have. You brought us all the way here and now you're letting us die? Mati tzake lai, Kodesh Baruch says to Moshe Rabbeinu, cut it out. Walk on. March forward. I'm Hashem. I can, I can solve this problem. The people don't see a solution. I don't see a solution. You don't see a solution. Two centuries of building cities and towers in the sky sunken into the sand. And now they confront the ultimate chaos of the unknown. And what does a Kodesh Baruch Hu do? On this, on this came the great song. This came the great praise. Where did they sing the song? What do I have to remember every single day? At the border between order and chaos. Not before they're rescued, but right after they're rescued. They stand there and they look back at the water, the glistening water. It's now the morning. And they see there the chariot, the helmets, the chariots overturned in the water. They see the bodies never floating, the whole business. And what are they saying? They're saying, now we're going to sing. Now we see the picture. And that's the song at the sea. If you have a sitter in hand, if you open your sitter to the Shirat Hayam, you'll notice something interesting. I'm just going to keep reading staccato lines from the Shirat Hayam. And you'll notice something really amazing about the Shirat Hayam, a word that comes up again and again and again in the Shirat Hayam. It begins, They fell into the depths. Sorry. Comes to the end of the song, we're mentioning again. 
Ki vasus for rechu for ashav bayam. Vayashav Hashem alayim et mei hayam. Uvnei Yisrael halchu vayav ashav etoch hayam. I got the message the first time. Just again and again and again and again and again. The yam, the yam, the yam, the yam. Because every day a Jew opens the Siddur and sings the Az Yashir and says, huh? we made it through the yam. And then we stand at, right before we stand for the Amida, we get up and we actually cite one, two, two sukim from the Shirat Yam. We don't sing the whole song in the Kriyat Kriyat Shemana. The Art School Siddur, page 96, you can find it in your own, your own Siddur. The two lines, I'll start with the second one. We spoke about it already. What does the Jew say? Shira Chadash, a new song, Shibchu Gulum Shimcha Al Sfat. Hayam, Yachad Kulam, Hodu Vimlichu Vamru, together, all of them, did they give thanks? Did they crown you and acknowledge you? And they said, Hodu really means to acknowledge more. Hashem Yimloch Lulam Ba'ed, which is found where? In the Shirat Hayam. What's the other Pasuk that we quote? It's a question. It's a wondrous question that's rhetorical. It doesn't really have an answer. We know the answer is beyond our understanding. We say, Mi chamocha be'elim Hashem. Who is like you among the mighty? Mi kamocha nedar ba'kodesh norat yilot osefele. Who is you, Hashem, who is like you, who is mighty in such holiness, Hashem, who is like you, and that actually we are proclaiming that you are beyond praise. You're too awesome for the praise based on the wonders that you do. Norat yilot means it's beyond our understanding. There's an element of awe that is within this. I'd like to suggest that when we keep speaking about the yam and the svata yam, it's because in our own lives, each of us, always, but especially, especially now, we're standing at the edge between order and chaos. And we're asking ourselves, what's going to happen to us? And we don't know. But that's the faith of our forefathers. That's what it means to be the ma'aminim b'nei ma'aminim, the children of those who were themselves faithful, and to actually have that faith as well. You know, we call it the Shirat Hayam. That's what it's called by Chazal. The song, it's not really the song Shir Al Hayam or Shira Al Hayam. It's really Shirat Hayam. You know what that literally means? Not the song at the sea, but the song of the sea. This is not my idea. I think it's from, uh, I, I couldn't find it. I'm, I'm casting about there's so much going on over here, like a tumult, like a tumult of an ocean. So, but it, I believe it's the Emunah um, uh, in the Sefer Emunah I think. Uh, Rabbi Wolfson talks about this. But we sing about the sea all the time. The song of the sea. Where's the song of the sea? We just had Shabbos. So Kabbalah Shabbat, we quote each time before we sing L'cha Dodi. We re recite the notion of the voice of Hashem. Hashem la mabul yasha v'yesh Hashem melech olam. God, you at the time of the great flood, you sat, as it were, you sat as the king of the whole world. Then we sing L'cha Dodi. Then we say Mizmor Shiliyam Shabbat. And then we talk about Hashem having reigned, having been the ultimate one who reigns. And what do we decide to recite? Nasu naharat Hashem, nasu naharat kulam, yisu naharat dochyam. Like rivers they raised, O Hashem, like rivers they raised their voice, like rivers they shall raise a destructiveness. Mikolot maim rabim, adir mishpurayam, adir bamarum Hashem. More than the roar of the mighty waters, mightier than the waves of the sea itself, you, Hashem, are the mighty one on high. You want to hear the sound of the ocean? You take a seashell, you put it near your ear, you hear the sound of the ocean? Next time you go to the ocean or you picture the ocean in your mind's eye, you should think a little bit that the ocean itself, the yam, is also singing a song to Hashem. You know what its song is? An amazing thing. This is based on the Petichta to the Zohar Kadosh, I don't have time to explain the whole thing now. But you ever notice that the word yam, the word mayim, water, is a palindrome? If you read the word mayim backwards, you know what it spells? Mayim. You know what the word mayim is? You know what the word yam is? It's asking a question as it's song over and over again. The question is me, mem yud, who, 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 who. The waves themselves are reaching heavenward each time and crashing back down their attempt to get higher to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, they come back down. They go higher and they crash down. And in each crash of the wave, they're asking, Mi chamocha ba'elim Hashem, mi chamocha ne'adar ba'kodesh norati ilot osefele. And that's what you and I are doing every day before we daven, before we, our amida lifne Hashem. We're singing the song, not just at the sea. 
we're singing the song of the sea. Mi chamocha ba'elim Hashem, mi chamocha ne'er dava kodesh, norati lot osefele. You're probably asking yourself at this point, this is lovely, but where exactly at my Seder, and why not at my Seder if I'm singing so many beautiful songs, wouldn't it be great to actually sing Az Yashir? When they put together the Haggadah Shal Pesach, they did not include the words of Az Yashir. Why not? Well, if you take your Haggadah, you'll notice that actually it does mention the, the uh, episode of uh, the Klal Yisrael seven days hence at the Yam. We mention it several times over, just by the by. We mention the Mechilton Parshat B'Shalach, Rabbi Yosef Aglili, Rabbi Eliezer, and Rabbi Akiva trying to show that at the Yam, there was even more of a miracle in the song known as Dayenu, about all the great phases that we have. What do we sing? We have, for some things, a couple of lines. But suddenly we have, um, If he had split the sea for us and not permitted us to cross through it, Diana would have been enough to say thank you. Really? Wouldn't we be dead? But the sight of seeing the sea split, of seeing the chaos before them that threatens them in the hands of a Kodesh Bar who like putty in his hands, after all it is, he created it, he owns it, he controls it. That would have been enough to give them chizuk, to say a Kodesh Bar Hu, you can do away with chaos in a second. You have your end betocho, lo shikot serena betocho, had he caused us to cross through it and our enemies had not been destroyed therein, would have been enough to say thank you. And so on and so forth. But when you go to the end of the Haggadah, everyone is waiting. I'm waiting with bated breath. When are we going to sing the song at the sea? It's a perfect song. We were saved. We thought about it. And now we're singing a beautiful song. But we don't. Where did it go? We say a hal Haggadah. In the hal Haggadah, we have Hodol Hashem Kitokim Chazdo, 26 lines. It's all great but it doesn't mention the Shir Hayam. And then we realize something really unbelievable, which I don't know about you. For me, the last three Shabbos, it's been very challenging for me to read um, one particular prayer, which we say on Shabbos and on Yom Tov, the only days we can actually think and get our heads together, and also at the Leil HaSeder. It's part of Halal Hagadol, and it's where the Seder expands from just about us as a people to being universal. It's the prayer known as Nishmat Kol Chai Tavarech Et Shim Hashem Elokeinu. The soul of all that lives will bless your name, Hashem our God. The spirit of all flesh will always glorify and exalt your remembrance, O King. From suddenly we start saying, from eternity to eternity, you are God. Without you, we have no king. There's no redeemer. There's no savior who liberates, rescues, sustains, shows compassion in every time of trouble and distress. We speak here not just of Klal Yisrael. We speak here of the B'nai Noach as well. We speak here about all human beings. Do you know where the Shirat Hayam is on the night of the Seder? Do you know where it is in the Haggadah Shal Pesach? How does it appear at my table? Keep reading in the Nishmat Kolchai. Ilufinu Malay Shira Kayam. If my mouth was filled like song, like an ocean, Ulushoneinu Rina Kamon Galav, and if our tongue was with jubilation and celebration as its myriad waves, Vesiftotinu Shavach Merchavi Rakia. If our lips were full of praise like the spacious heavens, you know what the Sfat Hayam really is? It's not the Sfat Hayam we thought that is the borderline between the ocean and the land. You want to know what the Sfat Hayam is? It's that line across the horizon where the ocean meets the sky. If our lips were like that Sfat Hayam, if our eyes shone like the sun and the moon, if our hands were outstretched like eagles of the sky, and if our feet were as swift as hinds, still, we could not thank you enough, Lord our God, and the God of our ancestors, and to bless your name for even one of the thousand, thousands, and myriad, myriads of favors you did for our ancestors and for us. Now listen to these words, because for me, this has had great resonance the last few weeks, and I suspect it will be challenging, but in a happy way, in a moving way, to read at the Seder. Yes, you took us out of Egypt. You took us out of the house of bondage. On our hunger, you fed us. You gave us plenty to sustain us. You, Hashem, have saved us from the sword. You have caused us to be saved and escape from the plague. And you, Hashem, you have lifted us up and out from illnesses and diseases that were serious and lasting. 
Ad Haina, until this point, Azaruna Rachamecha, O merciful one, you have helped us. Vulazavunu Chasidecha, your kindness has not abandoned us. Vaal Tichenu Hashem Elokeinu Lanetzach. Do not forsake us, Hashem, our God, forever and ever. You want to know where the ocean is in the night of the Seder? It's in the person who is saying the words of the Haggadah. It is churning within the person who has questions about things they don't understand. One of the ways we accomplish secret Siat Mitzrayim is not to read the book, not to declare things on laminated cards, let's eat. It's to ask questions. You know what I ask questions about? That which is beyond me, that which I truly do not understand. And you know what? It stresses me out a little bit that I have questions. That's how a child feels when they learn. That's why learning sometimes is frustrating because I ask questions and I, I, don't, I don't like the answers or I don't understand the answers or I ask follow-up questions. That's why there are children asking their parents. And if you're by yourself for your Seder, make no mistake, the Rambam Paskins, you have to ask the questions to yourself because inside of you, you are part of B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. And Klal Yisrael, the B'nai Yisrael, we have a lot of questions. We've had a lot of questions for many, many generations. And this year we'll have other questions. That's an ocean inside of us that is asking again and again, Lama and Manishana and Ma. And it's also asking ultimately me. Because standing behind it all is Mi Chamocha Ve'elim Hashem. Mi Chamocha Nedabar Kodesh Norat Yilot Fela. Now look with me at the end of this tefillah together. We have a few minutes left here together. Just look at this tefillah. Look how it keeps going. The next part is about my body, my physical body, sitting at my Seder, or in the case of Shabbos and Yontif, sitting, God willing, in Shul, or sitting in Shulam Yerach Kodesh, or in my own home, to Davin in the morning, Shabbos and Yontif. Al came, therefore, everything I spoke about, about the ocean inside of me, I don't think it's just poetic language, believe you me. Nishma Kochai is, according to our Chachamim, written by the Rishonim, might have roots even earlier. It has deep, deep meanings. I think this is one of them. Al came, therefore, a varim shipilag to bond, therefore the limbs you formed within us, the spirit and the soul you breathe into our nostrils, the tongue you placed in our mouth. You know what we're going to do with those things? They will thank and bless, praise and glorify, exalt and esteem, how do homage to your name, O King our God. Not just my mouth, not just the mouth of Jews sitting in Siddharim alone or together or feeling alone or whatever it is. All mouths of all of humanity will give thanks to you. Every tongue will vow allegiance. Every knee shall bend to you. I was on a conference call last Sunday with Maran Harav Usher Weiss, one of the great post of our generation. He said to the Rabban, there are a hundred plus rabbis on the line. He said, when I'm saying Elenu Shabbat every day for my life, I couldn't understand. What does it mean? All the knees will bend to you, Hashem. But he says, I see the entire world practically, right now, is united in being brought to their knees. Every upright body will bow to you. Everybody's heart, everyone's heart will fear you. And everyone's innards, their innermost being will sing praises to your name. As it is written, now look at the next words, the quote from Tehillim, chapter 35. Kol says David Amel, all of my bones, every limb, every fiber of my being will say, Hashem, God, mi chamocha, who is like you. Whether that impoverishment is financial, or whether that impoverishment is in health, whether it has come about because of what we call something in the world, the nature that HaKadosh Baruch Hu set up and continues to direct now, or whether it's because of those who have robbed us of something. Regardless, David HaMelech, where do you think he got the words, Mi Mocha? He got them from Kala Yisrael standing together at the edge between order and chaos, between what they know and the beyond, between a world that seems stable and one that is completely uncertain. And they're looking out at the ocean and saying, just like the ocean is saying, Mi Mocha Ba'elim Hashem. It's a rhetorical question that really has no answer. Turn the page 
in your sitter if it's the next page. You understand why the next thing that we say in the sitter every Shabbos, and we say it after the Leil HaSeder. I was wondering, be Kevin, I'm sitting at my Seder. It's been uh, two, three hours. I have to dive in Shabbos at night. I'm going to do it in a few hours. Sometimes I'm sitting at the Seder. It's uh, approaching one in the morning. I'm thinking, I, I got to wake up at uh, eight o'clock. I got to go to shul. We'll say it again. But now look at the next words. Mi yid melach, umi yishvelach, umi yarachlach. Who is like you? Who's equal to you? Who can be compared to you? And look, it's like a davening over here. Just like the Amida. Hakel hagado hagibor v'hanora. Kelo yon konei shemayin v'aretz. And we go from there. And that's where we proclaim a Kaddish Baruch Hu, the Melech at our actual Seder. Now you understand why, before we daven Shemun Esrei, before the Amida, the last thing that we do is we imagine, as we're standing up to, to daven Shemun Esrei, those of us who put a talus on our heads, put a talus, those of us who don't have a talus, who hold a Siddur, we're thinking, I'm back standing now at the edge where the ocean meets the land, where the ocean meets the sky. And here, I will be able to pour out the ocean within me before HaKadosh Baruch Hu in my tefillah. And that's why we say, Tzur Yisrael. You know what you are for me now, Hashem? You're my rock. I had a few people the last uh, week or so, I saw them in the street. You know, they said, oh, so-and-so is my rock. They told me, a I said, how are you holding up? Oh, I saw so-and-so, they're my rock. Okay, smile and nod, walk on. You know what the rock of ours is? There's only one rock. It's at Sur Yisrael. Because when times are tough, when everything is unstable, the ultimate object that we think of that is solid is the Tzur, the rock. Tzur Yisrael, kuma be'ezrat Yisrael, uvdeichin umecha Yehuda v'Yisrael, goleinu Hashem tzvakot, kedosh Yisrael, boruch ata Hashem, gal Yisrael. Where did Chazal get those, that, those words from? They got them from the Pasuk that we say at the end of the Amida. Yul ratzen imre fi v'hegen libi l'fanech Hashem, Suri Vigoali, the 19th chapter of Tehillim. God, you are my rock, and then you are my redeemer. First, I need to feel a sense of stability, create some order, to feel that there's some order left in the world, and then I'll daven like mad for redemption. Therefore, I'll say, Baruch Hashem Gal Yisrael, and the next thing that I will do is I will open my mouth in prayer. And you know what that prayer is? It's an expression, obviously, of praise, an expression of thanksgiving, but during the weekdays, it's where I pour out all my requests of Hashem and I say, there's such chaos in my life. Can you help me? And therefore, at the beginning, it's Tzur Yisrael and Go'aleinu Hashem Tzvakot, Kiddosh Yisrael. And at the end, it's Hashem Tzuri Vigo'ali. And then I go off to my day. Because God, you're my rock. And having said these words to you in my Amida, Lifna Hashem, you're my rock. Now I'm going to go out into the world. I'm going to deal with everything else I have to deal with. Rav Avram Shor, the Haggad Lekach Valibuv, says, based on the Chai Adam, he has an idea. He says, if you count up all of the brachot that you say at the Seder, based on the Chai Adam, the total number of brachot we say at the Seder, Baruch Atah Hashem, those words, is 18. According to those who hold, and that's from my other Shabbos of God, Josh, about Urchatz and Rachza, the Rambam and others hold, you have to say, al Natila Yadam on Urchatz, it's 19 brachas. Does this number sound familiar to you? Says of Avram Shor, based on the Chai Adam, a person sitting at their Seder, even if they're by themselves, is actually engaged in an unbelievable act of tefillah of prayer before God. We're praying for some order in our lives. We're praying that we should feel a Kodesh Baruch Hu's presence in our lives until we get there. We're praying that the order, the Seder, which includes sevel, suffering, subjugation of the tyrannical regimes, and the chaos of a world that has gone so much awry in so many respects, be ordered now. That we recognize that those who got out of Mitzrayim were both fixing the world of Chomer and Livenim, of mortar and bricks from the Migdal Bavel, and fixing the world that was the antediluvian, the before the flood world. And we're building it again, facing down too much order and facing down too much chaos. Says of Avram Shore, it is not an accident that the Gemara Masechet Brachot describes when it wants to describe how the Shmanesre, the Amida, the 18 Brachot of Shmanesre, which today is really 19 because of Vilam Alshinim, when it was written, it was written by the Anshe Knesset Agdola, think uh, 5th century and 4th century BCE, 
but it was only at the time of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash in the base Medrash of Rabban Gamliel of Yavne, who's in our Haggadah, that he told one of his Chachamim, Shimon HaPakuli, go and order the Shmon Esrei. Shimon HaPakuli, Hisdir Yodchet Brachot, he ordered them. He made a Seder. I have one closing story. But before that story, let me sum up and just tell you very practically what the time period we're living in, I believe, calls us to do. And it is no accident that it came between Purim and Pesach. I talked about the Purim side of it. We have to be Mamli HaKadosh Baruch Hu and not a Hasveros. See, Mamli HaKadosh Baruch Hu and not another Corona that's running through the world and trying to crown itself as running things over here. This is not just an assertion. It's also a declaration of faith. But here comes Pesach, Seder. The time of Seder says, whatever my chaos is for Pesach, I'm making a Seder of my house. I'm going to organize it. I'm going to make a Seder of my table. I'm going to order the table. I'm going to order the night. I'm going to order how I drink my wine. I'm going to order how I put the things on the table. I'm going to order exactly how I'm going to lean. I'm going to order things with the nicest items that I own. I'm going to think about the chaos within me now, the yam, Ilufinu mole shira kayam. If my mouth was filled like the ocean, I'd be asking me, 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 me. And in fact, I am going to at my Seder toward the end. But it's a night not of chaos. It's a night of order. And then I'm going to daven. And every day that I daven, let it start today. Let it start right now, tonight at Mariv. To stand before our Kodesh Baruch Hu, al sfat hayam, to say two sentences. Mi chamocha, and then Hashem imloch leulam va'ed. By the by, the Jewish people, after they stood at the edge of the sea, what happened next? They turned and faced the next, the next chaos of the Midbar, stretching out sand dunes, which they ended up staying in much, much longer than they had hoped. But they kept going. They kept traveling. traveling. The Barabani Sovi saw was not just to get through the, ocean, the, the, the waters of the Reed Sea of the Yamsuf, it was to keep going. By the way, Yamsuf, Yamsuf means the Sea of Reeds, you know that in the Sefer Torah, you could also have read it just as easily as Yam Sof, the sea that is the end. We're at the end now? We're not at the end. We're not at the end. We're at the end of the beginning. We're going to keep going. Churchill once said it about Britain. I think uh, the Torah already had it on him for three millennia before. You at the Yam Suf? Mm -mm. We're going to keep going. The end of the Sefer Torah says that uh, Kodesh Borgu showed up, Moshe Rabbeinu, the whole of Eretz Yisrael, Ad Hayam HaAcharon, says Rashi, Ad Hayom HaAcharon. He showed him to the last day. He showed him what would be till Tchir HaMetim. Let's get some order. Get some order through Pesach. Get some order, create a Seder Hayom, an organization of your day around two types of Seder, the Seder of Tefillah in a book that what do we call this book? The Sidur. Not just because the organization of the prayers, because it orders us. What do we need? Where are we in the world? By the time a person is davened in the morning, one time, they have spoken about the sun and the moon and the stars and the oceans every single time. And about snow and about the desert and about animals and about uh, instruments that we play to make music. You know why? Because the music organizes us. A song puts things in order. The Sfatimat teaches elsewhere, Az Yashir Moshe Davka Ashir Bilashon Shar or Shura, a line, because the song organizes in my mind the beginning, the middle, and the end. And there's a sense of a repeat in it, but it keeps going and going and going. Az Yashir, the song now and the song in the future. Now, there's another Seder. It's the Seder of the Parshiot HaShavuah. I don't know about you, but for me, I'm trying to flatten the curve of the virus by staying home, staying out of the grocery store. But you know what's become flat for me? Time. How long has this been going on for? How many days has it been? Unless I kept on my wall, like Robinson Crusoe, put it marking off on the, on the wall each day. How many days has it been actually? Is anyone keeping count? When did that happen? Was it last week? No, that was two weeks ago. That was three weeks ago. The time starts running together. But a Jew organizes themselves based on the Parsha HaShavuah. I say it every time to the not more uh, people who are not so religious. They want to say, well, what do you mean every week you're reading a parsha, you organize yourself? I tell them, ancient sea mariners would sail the oceans of the world and they would look to the stars in the sky to know their position. You know what we're doing every week? 
Our stars in the sky are not stars. They are Parsha HaShavua. The other version of that story that I've told now a couple of times since this all began, and many times before it, when my wife Zayda, Zichon Livracha, Rabbi Yanko Ring, Rabbi Yaakov ben Shmuel, Zichuto Yagen Aleinu, who was a Talmud in the Mir, was running, running from Europe, from Mir, up to Vilna, and from Vilna overland to Siberia, and from there they came down to Kobe, Japan. He was on that ship together with Mori Varabi, Harav Pinchas Hirschbrum, Zichar Tzadavik, Kodesh Livracha, Zichuto Yagen the chief rabbi of Montreal. He was a Bachar, also another yeshiva, Shivat Chachmei Lublin. They were all on the boat. They were traveling in the same boat, traveling together to get to Shanghai, China. And so goes the story that one of the Bachar came up on deck as they were pulling into Shanghai Harbor. And there he saw his Rebbe, Reb Chaim Shmuel Levitz, standing looking out at the harbor. And he, he exclaimed, Rebbe, Rebbe, where are we? And what did the Rebbe say to him? He didn't look at him. Look straight ahead. He said, we're on Kiddush and Daf Memo Medalev. For those of us who are on the Daf, hold on to the Daf. It's a Seder in learning. You're not doing the Daf Yomi? Take a Seder in learning. Find a book, a Sefer, and learn it. Take a Parsha to Shavuah, learn it, read it. That will anchor you. It will ground you in time and organizing yourself. No doubt you heard that beautiful song, a sad song. I'm going to send it out now for, following this, um, this presentation by Yishai Rebo. Amazing, amazing. You know, I already gave it. Shabbat Shuvah Drash was all about him. I almost made the Shabbat Sagala Drash about him then. He wrote the song only within the last week, yeah? It was released, I think, last Tuesday. And I keep joking with everybody who asks. I, I, I myself am responsible for over 100,000 repeats on the counter on that song. It's called Keter Malucha. What's going on in that song, Keter Malucha? What's in the song? The song is organized around the Parsha of Shavua. Between Parsha Truma and Tetzaveh, between Tetzaveh and Kitisa, Kitisa of Yaakov, Pekude. And by the end of the song, which is a song about a Cheshbon and Nefesh, everyone should think, what are we up to? A song that its song, the sound, is one that does bespeak a certain uncertainty, a, a, a certain tentativeness, but ultimately it is a song about the Biat Goel Tzedek about the arrival of Mashiach Tzikeno. And it has a question. What do you want us to understand from here? What do you want from us? That's our question. It's a legitimate question. Bring it to Yaseda. In the end, we're going to give you a crown, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And then, Shema Yisrael, we will recite, ending with the words, Hashem Echad, Uchmo Echad. We're going to say that fully and completely when Mashiach Tzikeno arrives. Let's make a Seder, my friends. A Seder of Pesach, a Seder of Tefillah, a Seder of Talmud Torah. I want to close now with the following story. The story is from Rabbi Pesach Kron. I think it's an amazing story. I hope you'll enjoy it. I'll close with this. And again, you could look after it. I'm going to send out that song. If you haven't heard it yet, the Ketem Malucha song, you listen for the, the rhythms of what it means that you're organizing something with a song. Az Yashir, Moshe of Yisrael, is an organization of those themes as well, of our relationship with our Kaddish Baruch Hu. And it's the ultimate song. Az Yashir Moshe in the future as well. Rabbi Pesach Kron tells the following story. There's a teacher at Derech Chaim Yeshiva in Brooklyn. His name is Rabbi Moshe Plutchok. I don't know him, but this is Rabbi Pesach Kron's story. Like many who live in New York City throughout the year, he and his family spend the summer in the mountains north of New York City in Monticello in central New York. There, Rabbi Plutchok attends what is known as a learning camp located in Camp Morris. It's one of the yeshivish camps there. He and other rabbis who teach in the various camps for Jewish youth in the area have a kolel where they sit and they learn together in the afternoon. They call it the kolel mechanchim. It's the kolel for all the people who are educators. One day, a few years ago, where Pluchok sees a businessman, comes in the base madrash, and he's carrying a bilingual art scroll gemara. The fellow is a beginner, and he's studying it in English instead of the original Aramaic Hebrew. It seemed a little out of place because this was a kolol mechanchim. It's educators sitting together. It's all rabbanim. And educators are sitting learning. And this guy comes ambling in with his art scroll gemara. The man sat down. And he started learning with great enthusiasm. When he would have a question, he would go ask one of the other people his question, sometimes even a younger person, until he got the answer. So Rai Plutchok eventually went over and started talking with the man. The man said to him, unfortunately, I have an advanced stage of liver cancer. Right, Pluchok said, I'm amazed at you. You have liver cancer, you're coming to learn every day in the base madras in the study hall with such an upbeat manner and learning with such incredible diligence. So the man, Rabbi Pluchok said to him, this is just amazing. It's a terrible illness and you're learning, you're so upbeat. Rabbi, the man said, I'll tell you the truth. 
The old scroll Gemara is carrying me now. You see, I never went to a yeshiva. And now that the Gemara is in English, I'm finally able to understand it. And if I don't understand something, I ask the rabbis here, it makes me feel very special. It enables me to feel that I can make a connection to the legacy of Torah and the Jewish people, and that's what's carrying me now. The end of the summer came. And toward the end of the summer, Rabbi Pluchuk walked in and he saw the man sitting on the side of the room. And for the first time, he looked crestfallen, sad and forlorn. Is everything okay? He asked him. The man said, no, Rabbi, not really. You see, the illness is progressing. And I was thinking to myself already today, what difference does it make if I learn? Who cares? You and the other scholars who are here are accomplished in your Torah learning. Your Talmudic studies really make a difference. For me, I don't understand everything it says, even in the English translation. When I ask my questions to the rabbis, I understand most of what they say, but not even all of what they tell me. So what's the difference if I learn? Who cares? Rabbi Pluchuk felt terrible for the man. But then he said to himself, incredibly, the night before, Rabbi Pluchuk had been listening to the radio, and he heard the following story on the radio station. And he decided to share it with this man sitting in the corner of the base Madrash in the Kola Mechanchim, Camp Morris. Listen to this, unbelievable. The story that he heard on the radio is that a century ago, there lived a great symphony conductor, an Italian maestro named Arturo Toscanini. He died in 1957. He led concerts all over the world. He was known as an absolute perfectionist. He had very few peers. Toscanini had a biographer who would interview him periodically over the years as part of a major book he was writing about Toscanini. One evening, he called Toscanini and he said, I'm going to be in town the next night. May I come over to your house to interview you? Toscanini said, no, you cannot come to my house because I'll be doing something very special that needs my absolute concentration and I cannot be interrupted. Maestro, the biographer, asked him, what's so special tonight, tomorrow night that you can't have me in your house? Explain Toscanini. There's a concert being played overseas. I used to be the conductor of that symphony orchestra, but I could not be there this year. So I'm going to listen on a shortwave radio, and I'm going to hear how the other conductor leads the orchestra. I don't want any interruptions whatsoever while I listen. Maestro, said the biographer, it would be my greatest pleasure to watch you listen to that concert played by an orchestra that you used to lead. I promise I won't say anything. I'll sit in the room. I'll be quiet the whole time. You promise to be perfectly quiet, Toscanini said. Yes, said the biographer. Then you can come. The next night, the biographer came and sat quietly while Toscanini came and sat down and listened to the concert, which lasted almost an hour. Finally, when it ended, he shut the shortwave radio. The biographer said to him, wow, wasn't that magnificent? Toscanini said simply, not really. Why not? Said Toscanini to his biographer, there were supposed to be 120 musicians, including 15 violinists, but only 14 of them played on this broadcast. The biographer thought he was joking. How could he know from 6,000 miles away over a shortwave radio that one of the violinists was missing? The biographer had his doubts, but he didn't want to say anything. He went home. The next morning, though, he had to find out for himself. He figured out how to get in touch with the concert hall overseas. He got the musical director eventually, and he asked him how many musicians were supposed to have been playing the night before versus how many had actually shown up. They looked it up, and they said actually 120 musicians with 15 violinists, but only 14 violinists showed up. The biographer was amazed. He went back to Toscanini. He said to him, sir, I owe you an apology. I thought you were making it up the other night, but please tell me, how could you know that one violinist was missing? Toscanini answered him, there was a great difference between you and me. You're a part of the audience, and to the audience, everything sounds wonderful. But I'm the conductor, and the conductor has to know every note of music that has to be played. When I realized that certain notes were not being played, I knew without a doubt that one of the violinists was missing. Said Roy Pluchok to the man, maybe to regular people. It doesn't make a difference if you learn Torah. But to the conductor of the World Symphony, who knows every note of music that is supposed to be played in this world, who knows every word of Torah that is supposed to be learned, every line of tefillah that is supposed to be davened, to him, it makes a difference. The man embraced Rabbi Plutchok, and he could not thank him enough. That winter, Rabbi Plutchok met the son 
of that man. He asked them, how's your father doing? The man said, unfortunately, my father passed away. But he added one thing. He said to Roy Plutchok, ever since my father came back from that bungalow colony, from that educator's kolel, every time he opened up his Gemara in the house, he said out loud before he started learning, I am performing for the conductor of the World Symphony. You may, be alone, you may be alone this Pesach, but you are not alone. Your Seder, your Ke'arat HaSeder, your Seder plate, your home, the way you are dressed, the words you speak, the songs you sing, the questions you ask are all performing for the conductor of the World Symphony. The song has low notes and high notes. The song has sadness and joy. It has moments of desperate despair and desolation and moments of jubilation and moments that will feel transcendent. All of these are part of the song. There is no other time in all of Judaism when we actually begin a service of any kind with a table of contents, except for one night. When we sing and intone the table of contents of everything we're going to do at the Leil HaSeder, 15 steps, Kadesh, Urchatz, Karpas, Yachatz, Magid, Rachza, Motzi, Matza, Maror, Korech, Shuchan, Orech, Tzafun, Barech, Halel, Nirza. Fifteen steps, like the Shirei Hamalot, like the Kama Malot Tovot Lamakum Aleinu, and like the 15 violinists in the great symphony of the greatest conductor of the world symphony. He wrote some that by this time, not next year, this year, will be Zochim, each of us, this year, could still happen, to get that call on our cell phones, to get that little piece on our Twitter feed. It'll be on every television station. The whole world will be united. Every Facebook page will have just one post. It's me. It's me, Eliel Hanavi. Don't wait for me at your door. I'm here now. Go to the airport. There's no one traveling now. Klal Yisrael, it's time to come home to Medinat Yisrael, to Eretz Yisrael. It's time to go Habaita and to play there the grandest symphony ever for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There we will be greeted by Mashiach Tzidkeinu, by the Sanhedrin HaGadol, by all of the Avodah the Imahot from all generations past, Az Yashir Moshe Uven Yisrael, Mikan, from here, say Chazal, Ramez L'Tchiyar Hameti Min Torah. And so may it be for us. And if it's not meant to be this year, then at least we should know each of us, wherever we are in the world, we are playing for him, for a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and everything we do matters. Wish everyone a Chag, Kasher, Vesameach. We should find great Simcha, even in this, even in this challenging year. And I wish everyone all the best. Shri Zochem to Biat Gold Tzedek. Amen v'amen.